Hello and welcome to our final episode of Creation Research Unplugged for our lockdown series. Yes, we've made the tough decision to actually finish the episodes for this series, but Lord willing, we will be back in the future and you will find out more about that as we go. But we thought we'd go out with a bang, which is why we've come to Nestcliff Hill in Shropshire and we've got some red rocks. Ah, you see, Earlier, before this lockdown came and I had to pack my bags and run back over here to the UK, I was also studying some red rocks just like these ones. But I wasn't here in the UK, I was over in the USA. Ah, these red rocks go all over the planet. So join me today as we delve into the red rocks. We're going to be on location, digging up some stuff, having a look at the evidence, as well as all of our normal clips that we'd bring you, what's in a word, the Archaeology 101, and all sorts of wonderful things from all over the planet as we bring these to you in our final episode, which we're going to try and make as long as we can and really pack full of all the wonderful stuff. So join me, Indiana Joe, join our friends from around the world, our experts, as we explore this week's episode and our final lockdown series episode of Creation Research Unplugged. Yes, with a name like Nestcliff Hill, you would expect to find some cliffs, or at least certainly a hill. And here we are, making our way up the hill. But do you know, it really will be worth it, because when we get to the top, the views are absolutely spectacular, and the geology is amazing. And really eye-opening, particularly in the consideration of flood geology. Yes? Now is flood. Uh, but now, as we make our way up, let's head over to our international director, John Mackay, uh, in Australia, Jurassic Ark, and find out what wonderful things he's got to tell us about in this week's episode. Now, in case you're wondering what the creation guy down under is doing this week, we're preparing a new fossil plant display. Uh, I mean, this lovely fossil here, I dug it up in a quarry and I carried it out on my back. You get some really good exercise in creation research. But remember, we like to ask questions. We've got two this week. One is, if we play rock detectors, what can we learn from this fossil? And the second is, how do you recognise it's a fossil in the first place? Follow my finger, Mr. Cameraman, and let's have a close-up look at that fossil. Oh, you can see it's split. Fossil, by the way, is an old word, means dug up, in a hole. Uh, and I dug this hole, dragged the rock out. But come on back to this fern again. Do you notice one thing, how clear it is? You see, we know one thing about this fern, and the answer is it was ripped up and it was carried from where it grew and it was dumped and buried. You say, how do I know that? Have a good look at the edges of the plants. They're nice and firm. No bacteria's had any time, no worms have had any time to chew holes through it. It didn't just fall into the bottom of the swamp and get eaten up. It happened really fast. It was buried really deep, really quickly. But have you answered the other question? How do you know it's a fossil? I mean, look at this one. I just washed these up. I dug this one up at a quarry at Dinmore. I mean, see, it's the same sort of split fern. This area is famous. It's a coal field, the Ipswich coal fields, and, and it's got a whole big layer of these dichroidium fern fossils. Now, it seems that dichroidiums are extinct, and extinct is pretty sad. We have more animals in the rock record and more plants in the fossils than we have living at the present. The world isn't evolving, it's running downhill. But question, how do you know that actually is a fossil? Um, you know, the answer is pretty simple. You know it, and I know it. You might know it's a dichroidium, but you know it's something unusual. It just doesn't look part of the rock. It looks beautiful. It looks like a piece of artwork. That's why some fossils like these can sell for a fortune in shops. They do look beautifully designed. Do you realise even if it's dead and buried, even if it came from the judgment of Noah's flood, you can recognise a fossil when you see one? You might know its name, you might not have any idea how it got there, but you do know it's unusual. It just doesn't look part of the natural scheme of things. No wonder God told us in Romans chapter 1, you can recognise the evidence of his handiwork, his handiwork in creation, the beautiful design of these sadly now extinct ferns, and his handiwork in judgment at Noah's flood, where he used water to rip up the plants and the animals and the people and bury them. 
bury them so quickly, not even the bugs or the worms had a chance to decompose them. Think carefully. The rocks do cry out the praise of God as creator, and they cry out his praises as judge as well. This is the Creation Guy. Goodbye till next time. Well, here we are, we've made it to the top and we have some spectacular geology. Oh, we're not quite to the top, we're only about halfway up. Come have a look at these cliffs over here. Some fantastic red sandstone. Triassic. Oh, Triassic? Well, you see, you have to understand there's a lot of stuff in the name and, uh, well, We've already dealt with some of this before on Creation Research Unplugged. Triassic is named after the three types of red rock that you find all over the world. The same way that Jurassic is named after the Jura Mountains where they were first studied, Cretaceous is named after the Latin word for chalk, Devonian is named after, well it's the County Devon, it's where it was first studied. You see the names of rocks have absolutely nothing to do with millions of years of evolution, but everything to do with where they were first studied, or what they're made of, or a description of what they look like. The old red sandstone, one of the three red rocks that you find all over the planet. Because yes, this is the same kind of red rock that we were working with over in Texas. And the same red rock that runs all the way up through Utah and uh, Arizona. Wonderful stuff, wonderful sandstone. Sandstone? Well come up and get a little bit close. Let's have a look down on the floor here. Hey, we've got some of this sandstone which has gone back to sand. Get in nice and close, have a look at this. You see, sandstone refers to the size of the particles that actually make up that rock. If it was really, really fine, it would be a mudstone. But the fact that it's this sort of hard, gritty sand makes it a sandstone. It's to do with the size of the particle. You see, so far, we've done lots of wonderful geology without even mentioning millions of years or evolution. We've just looked at what the word means and we've looked at what it's made from. But now we need to get a bigger idea of what's actually in these rocks and how they were laid down in the first place. Well here you can see above me a remarkable phenomena in the rocks. It's called cross bedding. You see how those layers slope upwards? Ah, this is really important and it's a common thing that is found in these red rocks, in fact in many rocks all over the planet, but particularly these Triassic sandstones. It's here, it's over in America, it's down in Australia, it's all over the world. But what is cross bedding and what does it mean about how these rocks were actually formed? Ah, there's a big history behind it and a big story behind it, so join me as we go and explore in a different location down in some Devonian rocks down on the south coast coast of the UK and explore wonderful phenomena which has got everything to do with cross bedding and this being formed very quickly by water. So just down here we've got a wonderful example of something called cross bedding. Now what is cross bedding? Well can you see on this big slab of rock here you've got some layers which are on a slant moving that way and then directly above you've got some flat layers. Now, wherever you get this, with the slant and with the flat, it's called cross bedding. And it means something very important. This rock, with the slant and the flats, and the slant and the flats, was laid down by water moving sideways. It's the only way you can get it, because as the water moves sideways, carrying all the sediment with it, as it is rolling forward, it will dump that sediment in layers and then smooth it off at the top. So, the Valley of the Rocks here was not only laid down by water, we know that because of all the ripples, because of the cross bedding, which is all throughout the Valley of the Rocks here, and all throughout this Devonian limey mudstone, this was all laid down very, very quickly by water moving sideways. Now I know this is a very technical thing to get your head around, it's quite complicated, so if you want the full explanation with all of the diagrams and the pictures giving you a complete explanation of it, make sure you get the accompanying booklet to this presentation for here at the Valley of the Rocks. Um, it will go into much, much more detail and you'll be able to get that at therockscryout.co.uk. But for now, remember one important thing. These rocks, because of the cross bedding, we know were laid down very quickly by moving water. And that matches up directly with all of the ripples that we find here. These rocks, this huge formation, was formed very quickly by moving water.
So down here on the beach, behind me we have this huge cliff face and we have a spectacular example of large scale cross bedding. The rocks directly behind me are at an angle, pointing up this way. The rocks above are flat, cross bedding, angle, flat, angle, flat. Now this is exactly what we were seeing happening over by the stream just round the corner. As the water is running along, it is depositing it sideways, making the layers at an angle. And then the water runs over the top and flattens it off, depositing more layers as we go. And then the cycle continues. The stream was at a small level. This is at a big level. But the great thing about water is that it always behaves the same, whether there's a little bit or whether there's a lot. Water always has layers in it. Water always behaves the same whether you're dealing with a little stream that runs through the beach or whether you're dealing with a worldwide flood. And a worldwide flood explains this cross bedding far better than millions of years of slow deposition does. So here we have a remarkable phenomena happening. As the stream is running down into the beach, it's bringing lots of little bits of sediment, the little bits of sand and then when it reaches the end, it begins to deposit them as the water is running over. Not one on top of the other, but sideways. Now in geology, the principle of superposition says that the bottom layer is the oldest, the top layer is the youngest. The bottom layer got there first, the top layer got there last. But we do not see that in the real world. In the real world, what we see is this. Water running, moving sideways, carrying sediment and then depositing it very very quickly it happens on a little scale it happens on a big scale and it can even happen on a worldwide scale just like Noah's flood you see here we have remarkable visual of what would have happened and it explains most of what we see in geology particularly cross bedding Well, there you are. We've begun to uncover the mystery of how these rocks here at Nescliffe Hill, as well as all the other Triassic red rocks around the world, formed. Ah, it was formed in water. And we know that because of the presence of this wonderful cross bedding. Oh, you see the layers that are flat? You see the layers that are at a slant? Yes, this cross bedding, these red rocks definitely formed underwater. They definitely formed under fast flowing water and they formed with water that was moving horizontally or sideways. And that's a really important point to uncovering how these rocks got here and uncovering the geology of the area as well. Ah, now we've just barely begun to scratch the surface. We need to get up high and have a look at the surrounding geology, have a look at the full cliffs, the full red rock. So we're going to head on up now. But as we do this, and as you come and join me, as we carry on upwards, let's head over back to the Genesis Museum of Creation Research. Let's meet Caleb Hubbard for our final episode in the series as he takes us through Biblical Archaeology 101 and the wonderful information that he can share with us there. Let's head on up. We've all heard of the story of God creating the world in six days and then creating Adam and Eve on the sixth day. Now, many would mock the creation myth, but it's interesting that while we believe that the creation account documented in Genesis in the Bible is completely true and accurate, there are many other creation myths which are very, very similar. Now, we're not saying that the creation account in the Bible is one of these myths, but the fact that all the nations around the world have the same very similar account of creation holds the biblical account into validity. The fact that God did create in six days, the fact that he did make man in his own image, the fact that there was a major flood, and that the people were dispersed over the planet. And as they were dispersed, they carried this creation myth with them. Now, in this archaeological pro program, we will be looking at many different creation myths from all around the planet. But today, we're sticking with our Central American and South American theme, and Caleb will be telling us about some of the Mayan creation myths. Now, religion. 
Religion is important in absolutely every single civilization that has ever existed. And again, like I mentioned last week, I believe that this stems from the creation of man from the Tower of Babel when uh, man understood that it was important to have a deity higher than themselves. But the Maya had an incredibly sophisticated view of this. Now, the Maya believed that the world was created, okay? They believed that everything was non-existent, and then a supreme god came and created all the world as it is known today. And in fact, they wrote this all down. They wrote this in a codex called the Popal Vu. And this was transcribed and translated by a Spanish priest who came with the conquistadors. And I've got a copy of it here. I'll read it to you. So the Popal Vu creation story, how they believed that everything came into existence. This is the account of when all is silent and placid, all is silent and calm, hushed and empty is the womb of the sky. Then these are the first words, the first speech. There is not yet one person, one animal, bird, fish, crab, tree, rock, hollow, canyon, meadow or forest, all alone the sky exists. The face of the earth has not yet appeared. Nothing stirs. All is at rest in the sky. There is not yet anything that might exist. All is placid and silent in the darkness in the night. All alone is the framer and the shaper, the sovereign. He who has born children and he who has begotten sons. Luminous he is in the water, wrapped in feathers. He is called the Quetzal Serpent. In his essence there are great sages, great possessors of knowledge. Thus surely there is the sky, there is the heart of the sky, which is said to be the name of the God. Interesting, this sounds a lot like the creation account. In the beginning was nothing. Only darkness existed. Only darkness and God existed. We saw from a minute ago, from the Popal Vu, that the God was seen as sovereign. He was seen as supreme. He was the ultimate deity. There was nothing at equal with him. There was nothing higher than him. This sounds very, very similar to uh, the creationistic view of the God who created all of the worlds. The Popal Vu goes on quite a while, so I can't read it all, but it goes into saying how this supreme, all-knowing, all-powerful God then created man, and he created man higher than all of the beasts that he had made, and he created man for the purpose to worship him. And now, when the Maya saw this, when the Maya believed that this story, which was passed on, I believe, from the Tower of Babel, they believed that the God was all-powerful and he should be worshipped. And this worship that the Maya believed that they were commanded to carry out to their God was carried out by the use of sacrifices, sacrificing animals, and by offerings, very similar to the Bible. But of course, things took a very, very dark turn, and they began to believe that their their life was on the edge of a balance, and if they did not give enough blood to the God, then he would destroy their world. And this is where human sacrifice came in. This is where bloodletting came in. There's some very grisly practices that they carried out of child sacrifice, of bloodletting running thorns through the tongue to um, release blood, and then burning the blood. Things got very dark. They got very sinister. This was not what the Lord had intended. It almost seems that a darker entity had come upon them and come across their mind, making their religion a whole lot more sinister. So again we see this is very similar to what might have happened at Babel. Man put too much trust in himself. He started to take things into his own hand just like at we see at the Tower of Babel. And just like we saw at the Tower of Babel, it did not end out well. So there you have it. The Mayan creation myth. Very, very similar to the biblical creation account. Now, what is the point of all this? And uh, how does exactly does it tie in? 
You see, many scholars would have us believe that the account of creation given in Genesis is just another one of these myths. But the fact that these myths are so close together throughout all of the planet, every single major civilization had a creation account which is extremely similar to the one given in the Bible. And there are little discrepancies and there are little differences, but they can all be matched back to a central theme. The same one that Genesis gives us. Now this is not to say that Genesis is just another one of these myths, because it is the inerrant word of God. It is the true account of how things came about. But the fact that we have so many other creation myths that can be matched back up to that gives that original account of creation given in Genesis a lot of validity. Because he was created, we were created in God's image, and mankind did fall. We went through the flood of Noah's day, and then the dispersion at the Tower of Babel. And people groups took these history, took this story, took these legends, which became myths as they spread around the globe. And little, you know, Chinese whispers, little discrepancies and differences slipped into all of them. So the Chinese creation myth is different to the Australian creation myth, the Aboriginal creation myth, which is different from the African creation myths, which is different from the south american or central american creation myths but they are all very similar the fact that you have this all around the world which can be matched up and shown up against the biblical account of creation gives that biblical account a lot of credibility Well, there we go. We've just about reached the top and the views are spectacular. And we've been exploring this red rock. We've been exploring what it means and how did it form and how can we tell how it formed and what can we learn from it? And, you know, we've just about wrapped it up, but there's one final thing we need to explore, one final thing we need to consider. So as we head to the complete top to actually learn about that and discover that, let's head over and uh, take our next Q&A session. Hello and welcome back to this final Q&A session of our Creation Research Unplugged series in this final episode in our lockdown series as well. We thought instead of going for a specific question that has been sent in by one of you, for this final little point as we begin to wrap the series up and we finish for the time being, we'd go for a bit more of a general question, but a question that Creation Research gets asked quite a bit. That is the question of, why does this whole issue matter? And why is creation research so into showing the evidence from the fossils, from creation, the evidence for Noah's flood, the evidence of human history, and showing evidence of the creator? Why does it really matter? Well, you see, it really does come down to a true worship of Jesus Christ. Because, you see, Jesus Christ is not just our saviour, he's also our sustainer. And he's not just our sustainer, he is our creator. And if you want to truly worship Jesus Christ, worship, show his worth. Give his worthship, give him the credit that he is due. And yes, his salvation plan for us is a very important part of why we worship him, but we have to worship him not just as saviour, but as sustainer and creator as well. It's that all-encompassing idea, that all-encompassing reality that makes Jesus who he is. Jesus Christ is our saviour, there's no doubt about that. But the reasons as to why we need a saviour stem back to Genesis. And he's not just our saviour, he's our sustainer as well. Have a look and read with me in 2 Kings chapter 4. There's a very, very fascinating little account towards the end of chapter 4, starting in verse 42. It says, Then came a man from Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley bread, and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, Give it to the people that they may eat. But his servant said, What? Shall I set this before one hundred men? And he said again, Give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left over. Now, you may understand or you may recognise there's a little bit of a parallel between this little segment, this little miracle that happened in the days of the kings by, oh, the man of God there is referencing the prophet Elisha. Ah, the prophet Elisha is here, we're doing a miracle. He feeds a hundred men from, and I like the way the New King James puts it, it's a few gifts, 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. 
this wasn't a big gift, this wasn't a big large amount of food, but with it, God used Elisha to feed a hundred men. Wow, amazing. But you may recognise a similar account to this in John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000 performed by Jesus Christ. Oh, it wasn't just 5,000 people, it was 5,000 men, plus their wives, plus their children. That's a lot of food, from just a few loaves and a couple of fish. Ah, what a miracle that Jesus Christ performed. But then you shouldn't be surprised, because you see the Jesus Christ that stood on that hill that day and fed the 5,000, plus their wives, plus their children, was the same, very same word who performed this miracle back in the Kings. Notice this particularly important part. A prophet Elijah here says, Give it to the people that they may eat, for thus says the Lord. They shall eat and have some left over. And they set it before them, and they ate, and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, that is Jesus Christ. You notice that the prophet Elisha never attributes this miracle to himself. But then don't be surprised, neither did any of the other prophets. They always attributed it to the word of the Lord. And that word Lord there is very important. It's a name. Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on how you like to pronounce it. It's a name and it tells us exactly which God we're speaking about. Because when it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that word God there, Elohim, doesn't actually tell us who the God is. It tells us about his position. It tells us about his power. Hey, it's even plural, so it tells us about his trinity state. But it doesn't tell us which God it is. But he doesn't leave us hanging for long over and over again, the God of the Bible, to find exactly who he is. I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Ah, we have a definition for which God we're speaking about. In Jesus Christ, he's part of that God, he's part of that Godhead, and he's the one here, the word of the Lord, who performed the miracle in Kings chapter 2, and is the same one who fed the 5,000 plus their wives plus their children in John chapter 6. Want to find out more about this word? Want to find out more about Jesus Christ, who is the creator? Have a look at what it says in John chapter 1, and it says it so brilliantly. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend it. Wow, what a powerful thing from, <laughs> from John here as he's saying. But you notice He's matching it up with Genesis. Yes, there's a parallel, and we referenced that before in one of our little episodes, but have a look at what it says here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hey, this Word is pretty powerful because he's the one who should be worshipped. He's the eternal Word because it says that he was at the beginning with God. Therefore, the Word has always existed. The Word is God, and all things were made through the Word. Without the Word, nothing was made that was made. The Word is the light. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot understand it. Who is this Word? Drop down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the creator. The Bible says it dates that explicitly over and over again, from John chapter 1 all the way through to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. All things were made not only by Jesus Christ, but for Jesus Christ, for his glory. But hey, if you've been watching these series, you'd know all about that. We've said that plenty of times. You have to understand, in order to properly glorify God, in order to show and attribute his full worth, you need to be worshipping him, not just as the saviour of mankind, but also the sustainer, the one who sustains us daily. And not just the sustainer of mankind, he's also our creator. Yes, Jesus Christ is our creator, so don't be surprised that he was the one who actually came down to save us. Yes, there is an important connection there. Understanding saving? Well think about it. Think about Moses. You see, the, Moses had gone up to the Mount Sinai, he'd been given the Ten Commandments, he'd come down, the children of Israel were worshipping a baby cow made out of gold, and they smashed the, and he went up to God. And he said, God, please do not punish the children of Israel, take my life instead. Wow, what a sacrifice Moses was willing to give. You know, unfortunately, God had to pass, because Moses was already a sinner. Moses had already sinned, he'd already killed a man. And he could pay for nobody's sins 
but his own. And he had to pay the price for sins. Because the wages of sin is death, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, therefore all die. However, if somebody, if a word is made flesh and dwells among us, if he never sins, then he should never die. Simple logic. But if this word who became flesh, who did dwell among us, who never ever sinned, and he did die, hey, he wasn't dying for his own sins, he was dying for somebody else's, mine and yours. Yes, Jesus Christ, who is the creator, Jesus Christ, who is our sustainer, he is our saviour as well. And he created us knowing full well that he was going to have to one day come and die for our sins. What a wonderful saviour that we have. So I would encourage you to delve more into this. Worship Jesus Christ if you are a Christian, if you believe him as your Lord and saviour. Worship him for who he truly is, our creator, sustainer and saviour. And if you do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, I would encourage you, do delve into the Bible. Find out more about this wonderful promise that God has given us. Well, we're nearly at the top. We keep getting these tantalizing views uh, th through the undergrowth. But before we really get there and begin to explore this geology that we're seeing all around us, let's go and have our creation special where we're studying a really remarkable organism that God has created. And we explore his genius of design behind the wonderful world of the creatures and living things that we see all around us. Today for our creation special, we're dealing with an organism. It's not a plant, it's not even an animal, it's not a protozoa, it's not a bacteria, it is a fungi, or a fungi, or a fungi, it really doesn't matter how you say it, it all means the same thing, and we've got a spectacular example of one just up there. Hey, can you see that? This is the birch polypore, and it's growing on a birch tree, Betula pendula. Ah, wonderful Latin names, and they really do roll off the tongue. But today we're going to explore this fungus, and we're going to see what it tells us about God's glory, as well as all the other fungi that you can find in the woods from now into October, sort of uh, autumn time. Now the birch polypore is actually a little bit crafty. You see the spores, oh the fungus produces spores, it doesn't actually produce seeds or anything like that. The seeds, the spores that it produces will attack the tree and kill the tree. Because you see in order to actually consume the tree, the fungus needs to, the tree to be dead. It needs to be dead rotting wood so that it's able to fully consume the tree. So the spores actually have the correct properties as the mycelium is beginning to grow through the tree to actually kill it and begin to feed on it. Oh mycelium? What's that? Well, you see, when you have a look at our fungus, the body that's sticking out of the tree, that is purely the fruit. That's the apple off of the tree. The actual fungus itself is in a form of mycelium. These are tiny little single cells called hyphae, which are entwined together to make a big mat of cells called mycelium. And the mycelium travels through the tree and eats away at the cellulose in the tree, killing it and then continuing to digest it. Only once it's digested enough to got enough energy does it actually produce a fruiting body using sexual reproduction, fusing the mycelium and the hyphae together and producing that fruiting body which erupts out of the side of the tree and produces the spores. Ah, very, very clever and a very weird and wonderful. You see, it's not quite a plant because it doesn't produce its own food. It's not quite an animal because even though it consumes food, it doesn't have an animal cell structure. It doesn't get up and move around like an animal. It's a unique kind of creature or organism or well, we don't really know exactly what it is, but we certainly do know it's a unique creation of God's and it's been designed. And it does a very, very marvellous job of actually cleaning up the woodland. Now, while the birch polypore, which is Polyporus betulanus, is a killing fungus, it kills the tree and begins to digest it inside out. There are many fungi which are actually essential for plants to be able to thrive, grow, or even germinate in the first place. These fungi form what we call a mycorrhizal relationship, and they are essential to well over 80% of plants on the planet. Ah, how fascinating! You see, they do something which the plants can't do. The fungus can eat rocks and they can crush the rocks and turn it into a soluble solution which the plant is able to use, which it isn't able to take directly from the rock. So the fungus eats the rock, breaks it down, feeds it to the plant and in return the fungus takes some of the plant's sugary sap that it is producing. 
Ah, very, very clever. And many plants not only depend on the fungus, many plants can't even germinate and grow to begin with if they don't have the fungus in place. Case in point, orchids. For years, orchid growers would desperately try and get their seeds to germinate, to no avail until they realised the importance of a fungus that you needed to have with the seeds in order to make them germinate and grow. How wonderful and how genius of God in order to tie this beauty into his creation, this wonderful order and the majesty of his creation. Yes, there are some fungus which are very poisonous to us. There are some fungus which even grow on us. I mean, you know that athlete's foot, that nasty flaky skin that you get in your toes? That's produced by a fungus. It's not nice. But then don't be surprised, when God created everything, Thing, he said that everything was very good very good the plants didn't affect us in a bad way the fungus didn't affect us in a bad way it didn't harm us it didn't feed on us and didn't cause us harm but the world is very different now to the world that God originally created. Yes, it was very good, but mankind sinned. Adam willfully chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, disobeying God, sin entered the world, and the earth was cursed. Because of that, thorns and thistles came on the planet. Because of that, God told man that he would have to work hard to make sure he gets enough food, and plants began to go downhill, and the fungus did too. Now we have fungus which hurts us. Now we have fungus which can cause us problems. It's poisonous to us. It wasn't originally intended for that, but it's a good design that has gone bad. And it's gone bad because of sin. Sin that we brought upon ourselves, but then don't worry, Jesus Christ came to save us from that sin. He came to break that curse, and in order to represent it when he was hanging there on a cross, he wore a crown of thorns, representing the curse which he was dying to take away. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? I hope you do, and if you do, I look forward to meeting you one day in paradise with him. What a wonderful promise he's given us and it's evident even in the fungus that we can see all around us. Well, we've just about made it to the top and there we are. I mean, just look at some of these views. They're absolutely yeah, spectacular. And we've also got a lovely outcrop of this red rock. Oh, have you been following what we've been saying? This Triassic sandstone was buried in water and it was buried in fast moving water and it was buried in water that was moving sideways. Our experiments that creation research has done into horizontal or sideways deposition gives wonderful evidence of how these things actually form in the first place. But do you remember what I mentioned earlier? Before the UK came in lockdown, I was doing research over in the States. And down in Texas, there was loads of this wonderful red rock all throughout the canyons there. The very same red rock that we have here. And two years ago, I was in Australia. And guess what? They have red rock there too. In fact, they're famous for it. Their central part, the red center. Ah, wonderful red rock, wonderful stuff. And you know what? It's all the same. And it's all been formed by water. It all has cross bedding. It's all been formed by water flowing sideways. And some of this stuff is really, really thick. I mean, just look how high up we are. In fact, you can have a look at the surrounding countryside and you can find this red rock all throughout the United Kingdom. Wonderful stuff, wonderful red rock, and it goes all over the world. Yes, you've got marvellous evidence for a worldwide flood. A worldwide deposit, extremely large, buried by water, water that's flowing with currents, the same around the globe. Yes, it's a worldwide flood, all right. So I hope you've enjoyed our little delve into Nescliffe here, but we've got one final thing that we need to go and see. Let's go and explore what's in a word, and as we find out the literature side of creation. Trust the British to ban the work of a Scotsman. I mean, that's what the, the Scots expected. Except this man had just written a story that captivated Victorian England, largely because it showed two sides of a hypocritical society, a hypocritical person, a, a nation that had high standards of morality publicly, but privately was a totally different matter. Publicly, you wore your long dresses. Privately, you had nude paintings everywhere. Now, let's be honest. It's not just the traditional English versus Scots antagonism that caused this play to be banned. It's the fact that in one presentation, their makeup and the lighting was so garish, people were so scared and excited by it, 
that when Jack the Ripper murders occurred pretty simultaneously, people were scared going home from the place, scared everywhere, and it was just simply shut down for the sake of public um, confidence. Interesting case, England. Interesting case of Robert Louis Stevenson writing a book about well, was it a split personality? Was it a man who took drugs and became a totally different person? What's actually happening in the strange case of Jekyll and Hyde? Um, you see, Robert Louis Stevenson was an instant hit. I mean, the book even stimulated him. Now, he also makes use of the general public's knowledge of biblical history. Have a listen to this segment, again, played out by our key actors, um, from this play and look for the biblical reference um, his time's up. Um, this is not just a drop in the bucket of biblical knowledge because the drop in the bucket is a phrase from the Bible that's called on English too. Now what other phrase do you notice that's being played out here that gives you a clue about how important the Bible is in shaping English and the way we use it? Small indeed was my appetite, this inexplicable incident, this reversal of my previous experience seemed like the Babylonian finger on the wall, spelling out the letters of my judgement. And I began to reflect more seriously than ever before on the issues and possibilities of my double existence. Now thanks again to a very mustachioed Catherine Nilsberg and her drinking companions, um, Joseph and Sarah as they act out this portion. D did you catch the biblical reference? It's a reference to something that happened way, way, way long ago in Babylon when the Lord's hand appeared and the writing was on the wall. It's in Daniel chapter five. It's a famous story, a true story. You see, the king was being judged and the writing was on the wall. His empire was just about to collapse. God had not only passed judgment on him, the judgment was gonna to come to pass really quickly. That's what happens at the end of our story of Jekyll and Hyde. Do you realize that the biblical knowledge is important not just for literature, but for the knowledge that there is a God who actually judges? Whether your name is Jekyll or whether you're Hyde, whether you take drugs to release your personality, Actually, there's a clue. One of my friends was a drug consultant to the United Nations Health Organization. And he and I had a good talk one day about one of the things that drugs do is actually remove the social covering, revealing the real you. Now, there's been lots written on Jekyll and Hyde and what Stevenson was doing and who the real Jekyll, who the real Hyde was, etc. that most people miss one thing. In the confession, just before he suicides, have you noticed the words that are used? I did this and I did that. You know, the Bible's also interesting in its comment on what we really like. Even the Apostle Paul said, the things that I desire to do, I find myself not doing. And the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing because the reality of man, the biblical picture, the real picture of who you and I are, is that sin nature is real. Whether you use drugs to let it loose or whatever is irrelevant. It's I, it's me, it's you who have this problem of sin. But don't judge yourself with suicide. You see, there is a saviour who's willing to save all the Jekylls and Hydes on the planet and make them one with Jesus Christ in whose image we were made in the first place. Enjoy the literature. It's been great to join with you over these past 10 programs. And remember that what's in a word actually started with the word who is God, who gave us the ability to use words. I've enjoyed this series with you. God bless until we meet you again. Well, we've got to the top and we're sort of uh, just chilling and enjoying the views and enjoying everything around us. And I thought it'd be a really good opportunity to talk to you a bit more about archaeology. Because we've been bringing you Biblical Archaeology 101 over our uh, series and in our episodes with Caleb, my brother, who's studying archaeology and he's given us a biblical perspective of world archaeology. This is something that's really important because when you say biblical archaeology, some people will think of 
archaeology of the Holy Land, Israel. Other people will think of archaeology of the Bible, so that might include, you know, Greece uh, and Rome, where Paul went to, or up to where uh, modern-day Iraq and Iran is, where the Assyrians and the Babylonians were. But in truth, biblical archaeology should be world archaeology, the archaeology of the entire history of mankind on the planet, but from a biblical perspective. Because you have to understand, the Bible is the Word of God. It is the history book of the world. It is a history book of God's plan of salvation to mankind. It doesn't just deal with the Jews. It deals with the whole of mankind and it deals with the spreading of the nations out over the planet. So all of history, all of archaeology really is relevant in some way to the Bible and it's important to understand and get that correct perspective. And what I've done here is I've brought some of those more well, we've been exploring the Mayan, the Egyptians, the sort of spread of the world, but we're going to come back a little bit closer to the Bible lands because it really does give us a nice sort of perspective to finish up with with archaeology. And it also shows you that these are all real artefacts from our museum project. No, we don't just deal with fossils and geology and living things. We deal with history as well. And these are extremely important. You see, we have things like this, cuneiform. Ah, the wedge-shaped writing of the Middle East area where they would put it into the clay tablets. Fascinating stuff. And these things really can tell you a lot about the time of well, this actually, some of these actually, like this for instance, this comes from Ur. Ur, yes, Ur of Abraham's time. The Ur that God called Abraham out of to start a covenant with him. And it's of a worshipper, worshipping the false gods. Interesting. Here's a mark of the uh, soldiers from Assyria that were worshipping the false gods. And here we actually have an idol itself. This is an idol of Marduk. Now Marduk was worshipped as the head of the Babylonian god, the chief gods, and he was worshipped just as much in the Middle East as the even more famous Baal, or Baal, the god of the Canaanites and the Philistines, the half-fish, half-human god that plagued the children of Israel over and over again, but then so did this god. He went by many different names, Baal was even one of them, but he was commonly known by Bel, simply meaning Lord. Yes, this was the Lord of the Babylonians, the Canaanites, the people of the Middle East, and they worshipped this god Marduk. But you know, there's a very interesting Bible verse in Jeremiah chapter 50, which actually references Marduk. Ah, let me read to you what it says. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 1, it's a title of Judgment on Babylon and Babylonia. The word that the Lord spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare among the nations, proclaim and set up a standard, proclaim and do not conceal it. Say Babylon is taken, Bel is shamed. Marduk is broken into pieces, her idols are humiliated, her images are broken into pieces. For out of the north a nation comes up against her, which shall make her land desolate, and no one shall dwell therein. They shall move they shall depart, both man and beast, in those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come. They shall, the children of Judah, come together. With continual weeping they shall come and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask their way to Zion with their faces towards it, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All who have found them have devoured them, and their adversaries said, We have not offended, because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, the Lord, their hope of their fathers. Move from the mist of Babylon, go out from the land of the Chaldeans, and be like the rams before the flocks. For behold, I will raise and come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall array themselves against her. From there they shall be captured, their arrows shall be like those of an expert warrior none shall return in vain and Chaldea shall become plunder all who plunder her shall be satisfied says the Lord you know it really does show you the fragility of these idols it's interesting back in Exodus chapter 20 when God is giving the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel you shall have no other gods before me. And then, as a separate commandment, it's not just you shall have no other gods before you, me, you shall have no graven idols. You shall not carve an idol out of stone or wood. 
And here we have one that is being worshipped as the Lord of Lords, the chief God by the Babylonians. And yet the Lord God Almighty says, hey, I am going to crush that. I shall get Marduk and smash her to pieces. I shall destroy her. Where is your powerful bell now? Where is your Lord now? He has been destroyed. In fact, it wasn't just a promise that he would destroy the Babylonian gods and the Babylonian goddesses. The Lord was going to bring down a country, a nation that was far more powerful than the Babylonians, and destroy Babylon, and it will be turned to plunder. And he did. They were the Medo-Persian Empire. And you can read about it, not just in history, but also in the Bible. But it's an important point. Not only is the Bible historically accurate, not only do these models and idols and real artefacts give you wonderful evidence of the truth of God's word from a historical point of view, Hey, this was prophesied long before the prophecy actually came about, and it was proven to be true. A true prophet, but then don't be surprised, it came from the Lord God Almighty. The Lord God who is vastly more powerful than the graven idol. The Lord God who smashed these idols into pieces. But then don't be surprised, this is a smashed idol. It's no longer part of the glorious uh, column that it would have once been. It is just a small little picture of the past. And yet it shows you very, very clearly that the Lord God Almighty is far more powerful than Marduk, far more powerful than the Babylonian's bell. Ah, real history, real artefacts confirming the Bible from the very beginning. So I'd encourage you to get behind our museum's project. It's extremely important to get this hands-on research, not just from geology, not just from fossils, but also from a historical point of view. The Word of God is true from the very beginning. Now, as we bring the Creation Research Unplugged episodes to a close, and this is our final episode, we thought we'd bring our featured resource to you, which, well, it's actually an issue that's kind of been forgotten in light of all of the coronavirus stuff. Climate change. What is a biblical point of view, and where does the evidence actually lead you? Now, if you've known Creation Research, you know we've had two DVDs, which we've had out for a couple of years now, about climate change. The first one is Climate Change, A Really Inconvenient Truth, where we delve into the history of the idea of global warming and climate change and really begin to delve into the real issue and the real evidence that you can find. Part two is climate change, the God factor. We give you a, not only a biblical perspective, we bring the whole point of Jesus Christ as creator and the whole point of God as Lord and Saviour who is in control of the weather. A really up-to-date one, we've brought on, by the way, we really do recommend those two DVDs if you haven't already seen them. They're sort of parts one and two. Parts three, a 2020 God's Eye view on climate and change. Ah, this deals with God's word on weather from Adam to Australia, and it exposes the climate's lies and the climate truth. Jesus Christ in control of the climate, and to warn you to beware of the false, the false science about climate that will lead you astray. It gives you up-to-date stuff. It deals with the fires that go on in Australia, the massive changes that we've had, or supposed changes that we've had, deals with the real evidence and puts it into a biblical perspective for you, and deals with the history of mankind on the planet starting from Genesis chapter 1. A very fascinating and very, very important and very relevant delve into the science of climate and a biblical point of view on top of that. Go to www.creationresearch.net. You'll find links to our UK shop, our Australian shop and our USA shop where you can purchase this for your very own and get that biblical point of view. Well, there you are, folks. That brings us to the end of this episode, and it brings us to the end of our series, the Creation Research Unplugged Lockdown Series. But do not fret. We are planning on coming back. We're planning on doing, Lord willing, a good couple of these series a year, and we're hoping to bring you more and more of the research that we've been doing, the work we've been doing, updates about the museum project, the worldwide research and preaching and teaching we've been doing. And don't worry, we're still going to be continuing on with our Facebook Live stuff. So make Make sure you like this video, make sure you subscribe to this channel, make sure you hit the bell so you see the continual stuff we're putting out. We may have finished this series, but we will still be putting out new projects, still be putting out new research, and we will continuing to do stuff on the Facebook page. So go over to Facebook, find us at Creation Research, and follow us for our daily stuff that we're going to put out as much as we can. But we've got many other projects in the works, including the Rocks Cry Out series. This is based primarily in the United Kingdom, but is available all over the world, and it's got some really fascinating research that we've been doing on-site, on-location, 
You don't know, maybe Nescliffe Hill will be on there one day. We've already published two of these books, we've already published two of the videos, the on-site exciting adventure research videos that we've done at each location. We've filmed another five, we've got many more in the works, we're writing the books, it's really really fascinating so do check out www.therockscryout.co.uk and you can find out more about what we're doing with that project. Remember we've got our UK Museums project as well as our Worldwide Museums project, our hands-on research, the museums where you can come and touch and feel and get up close and personal to all of the stuff uh, that we've collected over the years and the research that we've done. Similar to Jurassic Ark. Oh, if you're based in Australia, make sure you check out Jurassic Ark and get up there if you can. And we have plans on setting up Jurassic Ark USA as well, somewhere around Tennessee. So make sure you get behind us and support us both in your prayers and with your finances. We really do appreciate any help that you can give. Now, there are many other projects we're doing and you can find more about these at www.creationresearch.net. In particular, there's one special little project that we're working on which we would like to draw you to I have partnered with Nils Bird Training to bring you some webinars teaching and training and how you can actually be effective in your teaching it's great not just for teachers of Christian schools but also for home educators if you want a really eye-opening and revealing training session or webinar session in which you can actually understand the principles behind creation science and behind creation research so you can effectively teach your children or your you know if you're a youth leader or uh, you know in charge of children or some kind of education service it's really valuable resource for you so watch the next little uh, advert that we've put together promotional material for these webinars and find out more at nilsbirdtraining.com work with Christian Research, which is a Christian ministry set to uh, not just sort of preach in churches, not just send out as a missionary to people all over the world and preach and teach the good news of Jesus Christ, but we also do a lot of hands-on research. And we also help to supplement teachers and sort of train teachers to help them teach the same kind of subject to their students as well. Okay, focus one, we're going to deal with what a biblical worldview actually is. This is a foundation, something that we need to deal with at the beginning to be able to actually build upon as we go forward. And what we specifically want to do is introduce you to the concept and the idea of design. Because once you grasp that, once you teach your students that, your possibilities are endless with what you can do with design. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one fossil that I collected and show you how much information we can take from that one fossil. Focus 4. Biblical Archaeology and Anthropology. We need to establish a new perspective. We also need to not only establish a different perspective of the history of mankind on the planet, we also need to understand that there is a lot of fake stuff out there. There's a lot of lies out there and there are a lot of people who are willing to deliberately lie to you in order to make you think in a certain way. I want to... Okay, we're going to have a vote now. And uh, the vote is, what comes to mind when you hear Biblical Archaeology? So I've put Think Together. This, these are some things I want you to be thinking about. Um, you can add some things in the chat box if you'd like to. Okay, discussion. What is this? Um, if you... That's a very good point. And you can also compare and contrast, because if you try the same thing with, for instance, a piece of cheese, uh, it won't begin to break it down and just sit there because you've got cheese is mostly fat.
Well, there you go. I do hope you get behind this resource and make the most use of it because it does prove to be a very useful and important part of training the next generation of students, pupils, children to live their life for Christ. And it'll give you a fascinating insight into some of the principles behind the creation research work that we do. Wonderful stuff. And as always, don't forget, we've got wonderful resources that we've put together over the last 30 odd years and they're all available in our worldwide shops. If you go to www.creationresearchuk.com, you can find our UK shop. If you go to creationresearch.net, you can find our Australian shop and links to our UK and USA shop as well. As always, make sure you continue to keep in touch with us, continue to ask us questions because we'd like to put out little, uh, even if it's not part of the series, we'd love to keep putting out answers to questions and lots of information like that. We're hoping to do more Q&A sessions, live broadcasts with our Creation Research Worldwide team. So make sure you follow us, keep sending us feedback, info at creationresearchuk.com. And until next time, goodbye, God bless, keep your faith strong, keep asking questions, keep delving into the Bible day by day and explore the wonderful world that God has given us and delve into the Word of God, which makes the world of God become so much more alive and so much more fascinating. Goodbye, God bless. I'm Indiana Joe signing out for now, but continue to follow us and continue to support us. God bless. <laughs>